Welcome to lecture 4.4, functions. Let's begin by formally defining a function. We all know what a function is intuitively from grade school. We had silly little criteria like the vertical line test. I'm going to define it using the concept of a relation, a binary relation. So I assume that you've either watched the previous lectures on this topic or you know what a relation is coming in. So a function from a set A to another set B is a binary relation, so that is a subset of A cross B, such that every little a in big A is related to exactly one little b in big B. Of course, for notation, we often abbreviate the ordered pair AB being in F as F of A equals f of b. Recall that formally a relation was a subset of big A cross big B. We call A the domain, B the codomain, and we write f colon A arrow B, for f is a function from A to B. The image, or the range of f, is intuitively the set of everything in B that gets hit by f. So f of big A is one way to write that. It's what we get by applying the function to the entire set, which is the set of all little b in big B, such that little b equals f of little a for some element little a in the domain. Or we could just write this as the set of all elements of the form f of little a for little a in the domain. The preimage of an element, little b, in the codomain is the following set. We write it as f to the minus 1 of b. Now, I'm not saying that this is actually a function. I'm not saying f inverse. This is the notation that we use. And we define this to be this, the set of elements in the domain, little a, such that f of little a equals f of little b. So intuitively, if, if this is, or pictorially, if this is a and this is b, what we're doing is we're taking an element in the codomain and we're looking at everything in the domain that gets mapped to it. So that's what the preimage of b is. Several remarks. Sometimes a function is not well-defined. That's a tricky concept, and I'm not going to define it formally because it depends on the setting. But let me just give you an example. This happens especially if the domain is a set of equivalence classes. For example, if I try to define a function like this, f is a function from the rational numbers to the integers, where I take any rational number, m over n, and f of that is equal to m, the numerator, then that's not going to be well defined because f of 1 half is 1 and f of 2 quarters equals 2. So here we have two numbers that are really the same, but given our definition, they're mapped to different things. So, so that's impossible. And, well, you know, I guess I will say what what well-defined means formally. Um, in, in some settings, that means if A is equivalent, or say A1 is equivalent to A2, then it better be the case that F of A1 is equal to F of A2. So in this example, 1 half is equivalent to 2 fourths. Remember how we defined the rational numbers in a prior lecture as equivalence classes on ordered pairs of integers. In that case, these are equivalent, and it better be the case that they get mapped to the same, uh, same place in the codomain. Next remark. Sometimes functions appear superficially different, but they are the same. For example, consider the following. Suppose f and g are functions from z3 to z3. I don't remember if I've used this notation before, but here I mean z3 
is 0, 1, and 2, and everything is done mod 3. So the first function, f of x equals x cubed. Let's write out what that is. So f of 0 equals 0 cubed, which is 0. f of 1 equals 1 cubed, which is 1. And f of 2 equals 2 cubed, which is 8, which is in z3 equivalent to 2. So here, notice that f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1, f of 2 is 2. So that's really the same thing as the function f g of x equals x. So these are written different, but they end up being the same. We've seen things like that in, in, in logic, too. Things like De Morgan's laws will tell us that not p and q is the same as not p or not q. Finally, I said it before, and I'll say it again, the notation f to the minus 1 of b does not imply that f has an inverse function. And because of that, we don't even say f to the minus 1 or f inverse. We usually just say the preimage of b, and we just write it like this. Let's talk about ways to describe functions. One of the most basic ones is using a so-called arrow diagram especially if a and b are finite and small. And by this, I mean it's just a picture of the elements. So suppose a has little a, little b, and little c, and suppose b contains x and y, and we want to define a function where uh, maybe a and b get sent to x and c gets sent to y. So this is, of course, f of a equals x, f of b equals x, and f of c equals y. Now, recall the definition of a function is that every input must have exactly one output. So using our relation definition, we can say f is little a x, little b x, and little c y. But that's really not that useful uh, so we usually just stick with, with this here. But sometimes the picture is nice. And the picture is particularly nice if we're trying to find simple examples or counterexamples to things, properties about functions being one-to-one -one and onto, which is something that we're going to talk about later in this lecture. The next way to describe a function is with a formula. This is not always possible, but a lot of functions that we do encounter, especially in classes like algebra and calculus, there are simple formulas. For example, consider the function from the real numbers to the real numbers, where f of x equals x squared. So here the codomain is the real numbers, but the range is the non-negative real numbers. Next, sometimes it's convenient to use cases to describe a function. For example, consider the following function f from the non-zero integers to the rational numbers given by the following f of 1 equals 2, f of 2 equals 1 half, f of 3 equals 9, and f of 4 equals 1 quarter. And assuming this pattern continues, this can be written as f of x equals x squared if x is odd and 1 over x if x is even. I'm sure you've seen things like this in prior classes. Sometimes functions come from data and there really is no pattern. For example, consider a survey of a thousand people asking how many hours of sleep they get in a day. That's a function. One way to think of it is a function from the integers, zero up to 24. I mean, I'm assuming people are answering in whole integers. And the output is an integer between zero and a thousand. So here, f of n is the number of people who um, get n hours of sleep in a given day. And there's not going to be any formula for this, and you're not going to be able to draw this conveniently with an arrow diagram. So you just have data. You have to write it down in a spreadsheet, for example. Alternatively, we could interpret this data differently, where we could input the set of people. 
So let's give them IDs. Actually, correction, I don't want a zero here. In this case, the input would just be one up to a thousand. And the, at the domain and the codomain would be the integer zero up to 24. So here, g of m equals the number of hours of sleep of person M, or at least what they responded. So here our domain is one up to a thousand. Um, this is definitely not the inverse function of F. Well, for one, it, it, this zero should be here because it might be the case that zero people answered getting zero hours of sleep. So this is two different ways to use functions to answer data, in this case, a survey. Sequences are examples of functions if the domain is discrete. For example, suppose I told you that a n was 1 over n. Then the sequence a n from n equals 1 up to infinity would be 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 quarter, 1 fifth, etc. That's a function. The domain are the integers are the positive integers, and the codomain, you can think of them as the rational numbers or real numbers. Finally, we can express a function with a table. We've seen this in the setting of Boolean functions. We call them truth tables. A Boolean function is just a function where the input is, or the domain is the set 0, 1 to the n, so n tuples, or binary vectors of length n, and the output is 0 or 1. For example, f of x, y, z equals x and y, or z. That's a Boolean function, and we can express it with a truth table. Let's now give some examples of some common functions. First, let x be any set. There is an identity function on x which is usually written with like a lowercase i or an uppercase i, something like that. And it's a function with domain and codomain x, and it's defined in the obvious way. i of x equals x for all x. Next, let's fix a finite set, s. Consider the following, I'll call it a size function, on the power set. So f has domain, the set of all subsets of S, and the codomain, or the natural numbers, and F of a set A is just the size of the set. Here's another example. Let Z2 be the binary field, so the integers mod 2, 0, and 1. The logical OR function, which you know and love, can be written in polynomial form as follows. So the domain is z2 squared, so ordered pairs of binary values. And the codomain is z2. And f of xy equals x times y plus x plus y mod 2. To see why this is the OR function, notice that f of 0, 0 is 0 times 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals 0. f of 1, 0 equals 0 times 1, 0 plus 1 plus 0 equals 1. f of 0, 1 equals 0 times 1 is 0, plus 0 plus 1 equals 1. And f of 1, 1 equals x times y is 1, plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. So it really is the logical OR function written as a polynomial. Next, as I said, the sequences are functions. For example, the sequence 1, 4, 9, 16, etc. is just a function defined as f of n equals n squared from the positive integers to the positive integers. For our next example, let s be a set, and each subset a of s has a so-called characteristic function or an indicator function, and that's defined as follows. We usually write it with the Greek letter chi, so chi sub a, 
is a function that inputs an element in the set and outputs 0 or 1. Think of it like false or true. And the output is 1 if the input is in our subset and 0 otherwise. Now, first of all, I, I specifically did not use a capital X for the subset or the big set because that would just have too many X looking things with the conflict with the chi, both here and over, over here for the inputs. Um, and also, this is a simple looking function, but it's, it's really useful as a building block in many areas of math and computer science. For example, in probability theory and Fourier analysis. Both of those come to mind. Finally, if you're taking this class as a computer engineer or a computer scientist, you might be familiar with the concept of a hash table and a hash function. If not, that's fine. It's a little bit outside of the scope of the class, so I don't think I'll go into it. But the basic idea is that hash function it is a function where maybe if you're in database programming, if, you're, if you have a bunch of keys like usernames, user IDs, and you don't want to broadcast those publicly, Maybe, um, suppose my key is math, I might assign that. So there, there's some black boxy type function that might input a hexadecimal number. So A6 E F 8 3 1 D. And the idea is that it, it should, every single input should, distinct inputs should give distinct outputs. So there, there are notions of collisions, and those things are, deal, are dealt with depending on the actual hash function. So if this is something you're interested in, I'm not going to talk about it in this class. I encourage you to look it up. Let's now explore a few basic properties of functions. So let's take a function from sets x to y, and suppose a is a subset of x. Then we can define the image of a under f. So we can say that f of a is just the set of all possible f of little a's for elements in big A. Let's prove a lemma. If f is a function as above, then for any subsets a and b of x, I claim first of all that f of a union b is a subset of f of a union f of b, and f of a intersect b is a subset of f of a intersect f of b. Now just from looking at this, it's not clear which direction these containments should be, just symbolically, until we draw a picture. But even then, our picture doesn't tell us everything. And in fact, I'll tell you one more piece of information, that equality it's going to actually hold for one of these. I won't tell you which one just yet. See if you can figure it out in the process. Okay, so let's sketch this. So let's suppose this is x and this is y. Let's draw a picture. So a, let's say, is this set and b is, is this one. And then maybe f of a looks like this, f of a. Maybe f of b looks like this. Now, it's not necessarily the case that there is an intersection. These could be disjoint, or one could be contained in another. And that's why pictures can be misleading. So the first one says that f of a union b, so that's saying that the image of, of this snowman re region, which is this wobbly snowman region over here, is contained in f of a union f of b. So what does that mean? That means any point in this region over here, or maybe here, here, or there, is contained in either f of a, this circle-ish region, or f of b. And that seems like it should be true. And then the second one says f of a intersect b, so that says anything that is in the image of this intersection, which is this region here, something like, like that, that better be both in f of a and f of b. That also seems true. So think about which one of these equalities is going to hold. 
Think about for which one of these equality actually holds, because I claim one of them it will. Okay, so the proof for the first one, we don't have much choice here. We have to take something in the left-hand side and prove it's in the right-hand side. So let's take um, y in f of a union b. This means if, if y is in the image of a union b, that means that there exists an x in a union b such that f of x equals y. That's what it means to be in the image of a union b. So now there's two cases, either x is in, or x is in a or x is in b. So let's, so case, case one is that x is in a, and that means that, well, f of x, which is equal to y, is in f, is in f of a. And then case two is that x is in b. Then f of x, which is y, is in f of b. So what we have is that x is either in f of a or f of b, which means it is in the union of f of a and f of b. So thus, y equals f of x is in f of a or y equals f of x is in f of b, which means that y is in f of a union f of b. And that's what we wanted to show for the first one. Now let's do the second one. So let's take an element in the left-hand side and prove it's in the right-hand side. So once again, let's take y, which is in f of a intersect b. Then there exists an x in a intersect b such that f of x equals y. Now we don't have two cases, we just we know that x is in a and x is in b. So let's write that down. Then um, x is in a, which means that f of x, which is y, is in f of a. And we also know that x is in b, which means that f of x, which is y, is in f of b. So therefore, x is in f of a intersect f of b. Not, sorry, f of x, which is equal to y. And that's what we wanted to show. Okay, now that we prove in both of these, let's see which one of these equality actually holds for. So let's, let's go through one by one and see if we can talk our way through it. I won't actually write it out. I'll let you do that as an exercise. So let's look at the first one, and let's try to take an element in the right-hand side and see if we can argue why it's in the left-hand side. So let's take an element in f of a union f of b. So that means that there's really two cases. It's either in f of a, or it's in f of b, or both. So if it's in f of a, so let's call this y. So um, let's say that y is in f of a, and then that means there exists um, an x in a such that f of x equals y. So then, x is, is definitely in A union B, obviously, right? If it's in A, it's in A union B. So 
f of x is in f of a union b. And that's, that's what we wanted to show. Of course, by symmetry, x could be in b, but you get the same argument. So, so this seems like it's true. I mean, I'll let you write that up formally for practice, but this, I claim, equality holds. And now I claim that equality does not hold for this one. So let's try to find a counterexample. So let's, let's try to take a point in the intersection. Or let, let's suppose that there, there is a point. So we had it right here. Let's call this, I don't know what I want to call it, uh, z in the intersection of f of a and f b. Let's try to construct a case where that point is not going to be in the intersection in f of the intersection of a intersect b. So how are we going to do that? Well, one way is if, if the intersection is, is empty. So let's suppose A just consists of a single point, little a, and B consists of a single point, little b. Actually, let me make this simple. Let me call this alpha, and let me call this beta, because I don't want to confuse. I don't want to say little b and big b all the time. So let's say that A is the set consisting of alpha, and B is the set consisting of beta. And let's say that F of alpha equals F of beta equals Z. And then, then Z is in, clearly in F of A intersect F of B, but F of A intersect B is F of the empty set, and that well, that's just the empty set. So there, here is a specific example where equality, in general, need not hold. It may hold for certain cases, but not always. I want to say a little bit more on sequences. I wasn't really sure where to put it in this lecture, so I'll put it here. So sequences are just functions from a discrete set, as I said, usually the natural numbers or the positive natural numbers, depending on whether you include zero in your definition of the natural numbers. As an example, consider the sequence 1, negative 1 half, 1 third, negative 1 fourth, 1 fifth. There are several ways we can express this, depending on whether or not we start with index 0 or 1. So, for example, if we start with index 0, I like to call this the natural numbers, but that's up for debate. This is unambiguous. Then the formula for the nth term is f of n equals negative 1 to the n divided by n plus 1. So, once again, if n equals 0, then we have negative 1 to the 0, which is 1, divided by 0 plus 1, which is 1. If n equals 2, 1, then we have negative 1 to the 1, negative 1 divided by 1 plus 1, which is 2. If n equals 2, we have positive 1 over 3, and so forth. Of course, we could start this with index 1, and if we do that, now we get a different formula. G of n, I'll call it G, so G of n equals negative 1 to the n plus 1. So this just switches the sign. And now we have to divide by n. So if, n equal, if we call this the first term, then that is negative 1 to the... Well, so if n equals 1, this is negative 1 to the second, which is 1. Negative 1 squared divided by 1. The next term, n equals 2, is negative 1 to the third, which is negative 1 divided by n, which is 2. And the next one is negative 1 to the fourth, which is positive 1 divided by 3 and so forth. So for ease of notation, I think I mentioned this earlier, with sequences, it's just easier to, instead of writing f of n everywhere, to just, for short, call that a sub n. We'll talk more about sequences in a later lecture. At this point, I want to give you some definitions which you've likely come across in a previous class. But just to be safe, I'll, let's go through them. Let's let f be a function from x to y. Then f is injective, or 1 to 1. This is more the formal term. I prefer 1 to 1, so that's why I'm highlighting it in red, because I will usually use 1 to 1. If 
f of x equals f of y implies x equals y. So what that means, so let's think about what that means. That says if, if f of x equals f of y, so let's suppose that you have x and y, and they get mapped to the same element, so f of x equals f of y. Well, the only way that can happen is if x and y were actually the same to begin with. In other words, there's no way that two distinct elements can ever get mapped to the same element. So in other words, if, if these are different, then that picture can't happen. So a function is injective, or one-to-one, -one, if distinct inputs must give distinct outputs. So here's what it looks like. Maybe there are elements that don't, that are not in the range, but the error diagram is going to look like this. A function f is surjective, or onto, if basically everything gets hit, if the range is the entire codomain. So one way to say that is if f of the domain is the codomain. A completely different way to say that is if for all y in the codomain, there exists an x in the domain such that f of x equals y. So I think this first way is just a little bit simpler, but maybe this, this other way is a little more, slightly more formal, but both are fine. Finally, f is bijective if it is both one-to-one -one and onto. So to summarize pictures of these, I guess I already did the, the first one. So a function is one-to-one -one if its error diagram looks like this. And of course, these are for finite sets. It's, but I think you should at least get a lot of intuition from the finite sets. So th this is one-to-one. -one function is onto if it's if everything in the codomain gets hit so it does not necessarily have to be one to one it might be something like like this um, and then it's bijective if there's a perfect pairing between elements in the domain and the codomain so let me use a different color so maybe looks like this, so maybe it looks something like, like that. So if, if, every, if, if every guy in the domain sh can shake a hand with someone in the codomain. Of course, if we have a bijective function, then we can define its inverse function. And so here I'm, I'm using the same notation that I did earlier. I'm overloading the operator, as computer scientists will say it, but I think it should be clear from the context f inverse is a function from y to x, and we define it exactly how you think. If using the notation of ordered pairs, the relation notation, I will say f inverse is the set of ordered pairs b and a, such that a and b is in the original uh, relation. A different way to say that is f, probably an easier way to say that is f inverse of y equals x if and only if f of x equals y. I think I, I prefer that way. And again, the, the picture of this, I think you probably already have this, but let's, let's suppose that the arrow diagram looks like this. So if, if this is x and this is y and this is f, then, of course, the inverse is going to just be the same thing, but switch the arrows. So now this is y, this is x, and the arrows just go in reverse. Another definition that you are probably familiar with, but let's give for practice, is given functions f from x to y and g from y to z, we can define the composition of them which is a function g of f. It's unfortunate that we write left to right, but function composition is right to left. This is a function from x to z, 
and it's defined as follows. So g of f, um, several ways we can do this. Just for practice, I'll use our relation notation. So remember, a function is a relation, which is an ordered pair. So it's, it's a set of ordered pairs of the form x and z, such that there exists a y, in, in, so in this intermediate set, such that f of x equals y and f g of y equals z. I'll say it like that even though I wrote it differently. So another way to write this is f, so you can write f of, oh, f, f of g of x is normally how you would write this. But using this notation, I'm going to write g of f, so this is a function that inputs a point x, and the output, actually, I can just, I don't need to write, I can just leave it like this. So that's the definition of g of f, f. So I still like to, I still prefer this definition. I wanted to give this one to you just for practice. Finally, the last definition I want to give you um, we'll do this a lot in the next lecture about set cardinality, is what it means for set, two sets to have the same size. So this is motivated by that example I gave you above where I said two sets, uh, there's a bijection between two sets. If there's a bijection between two sets, that means the elements can shake hands. So if, if this is little x and this is little y, and f of x equals y, then think of then everyone in the domain can shake hands with the corresponding image in the codomain. So that motivates the definition of what it means for sets to have the same size. And which is clear if the sets are finite, but if they're infinite, it's not clear at all. For example, we know that the natural numbers is a proper subset of the integers. They're both infinite. Do they have the same size? Some would say yes, they have the same size, they're both infinite. Others would say no, they don't have the same size because this one is bigger than that. There's things in here that are not in there. So the, the real answer to this is, is there a way for everyone in this set, the natural numbers, to reach out and shake hands with everybody in the integers so everyone gets a handshake? That's the question, yes or no. We will explore that a little more in the next, in the next lecture. But formally, we say that two sets, x and y, have the same cardinality, which is a fancy elitist way to say size, if there exists a bijection between those two sets. I want to conclude this lecture with a fascinating and surprising property of injective and surjective functions. And it sort of hints at why we call them what we do. Both of them are blank objective. There's a duality between the two, which is completely hidden when we give the more down-to-earth definitions that we do and names one-to-one -one and on-to. The definitions, I hope you agree, are, are very natural, but they don't seem like they have anything to do with each other. But I claim that behind the scenes they do. So let's give a definition. Suppose f is a function from y to z and g1 and g2 are functions from x to y. Then we say that f is left cancelable if any time f of g1 equals f of g2, we can conclude that g1 equals g2. Now, this is going to be true anytime f is injective. So, so let's, sorry, bijective. So if, if f inverse exists, then by definition, f inverse of f is just the identity map, which I'll, I'll denote by 1. And then if, if we have f of g1 equals f of g2, we can just compose f in both sides, f inverse of f of g1 equals f inverse of f of g2, and these these things both cancel and we get that g1 equals g2.
Now, if that seemed like magic to you, let me show you a, a picture of it. And I don't know, this, this may or may not help. So suppose that we have g1 and g2 from x to y, and we have a function f from y to z. And suppose that we have that g1 followed by f is equal to g2 followed by f. Well then, first of all, f inverse exists, and, and f followed by f inverse is the identity. So if, if g1f equals g2f, then g1f f inverse, which by the way is g1, equals g2, f, f inverse equals g2. So therefore, g1 equals g2. That's the picture reason for what I just did up here. Okay, so that's what left cancelable means. And clearly, if, if, if something is bijective, if f is bijective, it's going to be left cancelable and right cancelable. Now I can't say it. I haven't defined right cancelable, but I think you can picture how to do it. It's Spoiler, going to be on the next slide. So what I'm claiming is that left cancelable is actually equivalent to being one-to-one -one or injective. And not surprisingly, we'll show on the next slide that being right cancelable is equivalent to being surjective or onto. So here's the theorem. A function is left cancelable if and only if it is injective. Okay, let's prove it. Before we do, let's write down the definition of injective because we will need it. So injective means that if f of y1 equals f of y2, then y1 equals y2. So basically that anytime we have, well, one way to say it is that it looks like that. Okay. So this is an if and only if proof. We need to do both directions. I'm going to start with the backwards direction so we can start with the definition of injective because that's, I think, simpler than left cancelable. So let's, let's say that f is injective or one-to-one. -one. And let's assume the assumption, or at least the premise of left cancelable, and what we want to show is that g1 is equal to g2. So let's assume that f of g1 equals f of g2. And our goal is to show, so our goal is to show that g1 equals g2. Okay, so let's, let's see what we know. So we, we, if we want to show g1 equals g2, we got to take the input of those. So let's take any an arbitrary x in big X. Then, let's see. Here, here's what we can use. f of g1 equals f of g2. So f of g1 of x equals f of g2 of x. We know that. Right, And then what else do we have? Well, we have that if f of some y equals f y1, so let's, let's call this y1 and let's call this y2, using the definition of injective, f of y1 equals f of y2, it must follow that g1 of x equals g2 of x. And so that's exactly what it means for g1 to equal g2, because we took an arbitrary input. Pretty simple, right? We just used the definition. It didn't seem like it when I proposed it. It seemed like these are two very different things, but sometimes if you follow your nose, good things happen. Okay, so let's go the other way, the forward direction. Let's assume well, it's, I think it's hard to assume that a function is left cancelable because then you have to show that this holds for all g1 and g2. So let's, let's prove the counterpositive. If, if f is not injective, then, f, then it's not left cancelable. 
So if it's not ejected, we can cook up a G1 and a G2 for which this fails. So let's, let, let's write that down. So let's do the contrapositive. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture as to what this looks like. So if, if a function is not injective, then what we have is so we have z, and we have y here. We, we have two points that get mapped to the same, same thing. So we have, let me call this one, let me use black to distinguish it, y1, and let me call this one y2. And these are different. So let's, let's write that down. Let's, let's say that there exists a y1 different from a y2 in y such that f of y1 is equals f of y2. Maybe it would have helped to say if assuming f is, assume f is not injective, then there exists. But I think the, the reader can get the point here. Okay, so then, then what? We have to cook up a, a g1 and a g2 for which g1 then f equals g2 then f. Let's draw a picture of this. So, so here's, here's x. And I don't know, the, the, there might be a whole bunch of points in x. What can we do? Well, what if, what if g1 sends everything to y1? And what if g2 sends everything to y2? Then doing g1 and then f, I should say that this is f, is going to be exactly the same as doing g2 and then f, right? So this is f. Um, but clearly g1 and g2 are different functions because these things are, are different. So let's write that down. So let's define g1 from x to y so that g1 of x equals y1 and define g2 from x to y so that g2 of x equals y2. Then clearly g, or I should, not g, I should say f then g, f of g1 of x equals, uh, let me, um, let me give this a name, I'm going to call that z, just for convenience, which is z, and this is also what we get when we do f of g2 of x. And so, but g1 and g2 are not the same. So that proves that direction, and that completes the proof. Finally, as promised, I want to show you that a function is surjective if and only if it is right cancelable. So now I'm going to say that f is a function from x to y, and h1 and h2 are from y to z. And f is right cancelable if and only if any time h1 of f equals h2 of f, we can basically cancel the f's and conclude that h1 equals h2. So once again, when it's bijective, you can cancel on the left and the right, but when it's one-to-one, -one, you can cancel on the left, and when it's on to, you can cancel on the right. And you know, I, I can never keep these straight. If, if, you let me, if, if you have a good way to remember this, let me know, because I certainly always get them confused. Let's now prove that a function is right cancelable if and only if it is surjective. First, let's recall the definition of surjective. That means that for all elements in the codomain, all y, there exists an x in the domain such that f of x equals y. Something hits it. Or equivalently, how I originally defined it, I said uh, f of the whole domain x equals y. And while that's short and sweet and intuitive, it's not really as useful as this pointwise definition in this context. 
Okay, so let's get started. Let's prove the backwards direction first, once again, because I just want to start with the definition of surjective to warm up. So let's say that F is, is surjective or, or onto. And let's say that this premise is satisfied. H1 of F equals H2 of F. Our goal is to prove that the conclusion of can right cancelability holds. So and that h1 of f equals h2 of f for, for some h1 and h2. Now remember, our goal is to show that h1 equals h2. Okay, so what, so what can we do? How do we show that h1 equals h2? So we have x, and x maps to y, which maps to z. So f maps x to y, and then h1 and h2 are maps from y to z. So to show that h1 and h2 are the same, we have to take an arbitrary element in y and show that they both map into the same thing in z. So let's take, take any y in big Y. Uh, since, and then since f is onto, there exists an x in big X such that f of x equals y. Okay? Now, we're trying to show that h1 equals h2. So then h1 of our arbitrary input is h1 of f of x, and we know that h1 of f equals h2 of f of x, which is h2 of y. So therefore, h1 equals h2. We took an arbitrary input y and said h1 of y equals h2 of y. And therefore, um, and so then we can say, therefore, f is right cancelable. Okay, now let's prove the uh, forward direction and we'll be done. So once again, it's seems hard to, to use this A implies B definition of right cancelability. And, and it's also hard to prove something is surjective because you don't know what the set's going to be like. You've got to take an arbitrary element in a set that you don't know. It might be able to be done, but I think contrapositive is probably easier. So let, let's do that. So let's assume, so say that F is not on 2. And so that means that, so there exists a, a y in the codomain such that there does not exist a preimage. Let, let's just say that the f inverse of y, that's the preimage, is, is empty. So let's, let's draw a picture of this. So we, so we have x, and we have y, and we have at least one point in, in our set big Y that has no preimage. So f is going to send, I don't know, it's going to map x into y. Maybe everything else gets hit, maybe not. Um, but notice, we don't have a z yet. Our goal is to cook up an h1 and h2 for which this is going to fail. So we have a lot of flexibility here. So basically, all what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to make sure that y gets sent to a different point via x h1 than h2. So we need to have two, so z has to have at least two points. Let's say z1 and z2. But let's say that z has only these two points. I think we can get away with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to map, um, so h1 will send y to z1, and h2 will send y to z2. 
And then we have to decide what H1 to H2 does on the rest of Y. And let, let's just make it really simple. Let's just say that for everything else, it's H1 and H2 sends it to, to Z1. So let's write this down. So let's let Z be equal to Z1 and Z2. Okay? And define H1 from Y to Z so that H1 of, you know what? I got to be careful. H1 of, I said Y, but I, I picked my, my Y up here. So, so let me call this thing up here something different. I'm, I'm going to call this thing Y prime. I'll call that Y prime. So down here, this, this is Y prime. So H of Y equals, so H1 of Y equals Z1. I'm going to send everything in Y to Z1. It's a constant function. And then I'm going to define, so and, and define H2 from Y to Z by H2 of Y equals, and then I'm going to have two cases. H2 of, of Y prime goes to Z2, so it equals Z2 if Y equals Y prime. And it's going to be Z1 if Y is not equal to Y prime. Okay, then by definition, by construction, doing F and then doing uh, H1, well, let me write that down, then, then, or now, H1 of F of X equals H1 um, of, well, actually, I don't need to say H1. I, I can just say it equals Z1, which is equal to H2 of F of X. But clearly, H1 is not equal to H2. And so, therefore, um, I'm running out of room, so I'll just say it. Therefore, F is not right cancelable, and that completes that direction and the proof. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed those last couple slides about how one to one and onto got their names from injective and surjective, you know, why they are similar, and how they can both be thought of as partially bijective functions, one on the left and one on the right. The next time we will talk more about bijective functions and about the little fact that I mentioned earlier of how two sets have, have the same cardinality if there is a bijection between them. And we will come up with a whole lot of neat facts that you will probably find very surprising, such as there are many different sizes of infinity. And we'll also come across a new unsolvable problem. In other words, it is outside of the axioms, the standard axioms of set theory. So stay with us.